Well, I think when you're offered a job, uh, it is some, you've got to be very careful when you're in an interview, especially if you're working with someone new, because you are going to be spending an incredible amount of uh, time with them. And it's, it can be a very intense period, specifically post-production. So if you've got any feeling that you're not going to get on with this person or you're not in any way like-minded, uh, I would recommend running away because uh, otherwise you've got a year of hell. Uh, if that's not the case and during that period you, you realise that you're both like-minded, uh, I normally find um, when I'm meeting someone new or about to work with someone new is you talk about movies, in, not necessarily the movie you're going to work on, but the movies you love. And uh, without exception, you know, as you listen to the director talk and they listen to me talking, if you're all kind of on the same page with what you love and what you like and what turns you on about movies, uh, you know you're going to get on. And if they're talking about films that you can't stand, you know you're not. So it's a good idea to be convinced that you're in sync, um, for one of better for want of a better term, with the way everyone's looking at the project. Because I think being an editor, you're being cast as an editor as you would cast a composer or cast a cinematographer, or in fact cast an actor. It's, you've got to fit in with the overall picture, otherwise uh, those working parts are not going to come together. A typical day in the cutting room for me would be to um, watch rushes first thing in the morning, at around 9.30. My assistant usually starts at 6.30, so that uh, her name is Charlotte, she can have rushes for me right away. Um, I watch rushes, then I start assembling each scene. And um, I normally have to send the assembled scenes to the director the same day. So my assemblies are very tightly cut. They've got soundtrack, they've got sound design, if there are any green screens, I re usually compose them first so that my assistant can finesse them. I uh, layer all the, the compositions I want, all the bits and pieces. If it's a visual effect, I add all the elements so I could have up to 10 elements sometimes. And because it's so time consuming, my assistant Charlotte does them and um, then we send it off at the end of the day for the director. Once I've watched the rushes, I usually either call or text the director to make them know that everything's okay, or if I have issues, if I want pickup shots, or if they're missing some of the subtext, we discuss it. I think the thing with Susanna that, that I responded so well to, and I think she appreciated, is she wants everyone she works with to bring whatever they can to it. She doesn't want to tell people what to do. She has very strong ideas and she has a strong sort of authorial voice, but she wants you to just bring your personality and your thing to it. So I would assemble, and I'd spend a lot of time working hard on assemblies, and some editors like to leave things rough and directors like that. Susanna sort of wanted more, not finished products, because it's never going to be finished, but to really work on everything and present things to her that you thought, this is what I think it should be. And she responded really well to that. So in a way, Working together, she was more focused on overall story and overall structure and pace and actual sort of technicalities of cutting the scene. If the scene works, she was happy. I think, as always, it was structure. It was how a lot of the stories were quite similar. So how do you make one person's story distinct from the other one? And that was the, yeah, that was the hardest. Thing. We, work, we work a lot with index cards and there were quite a few iterations of scenes going on and characters that would come in and then we would drop them. Yeah, that's, that was probably the biggest challenge. And, and also getting some of the scenes down, you just as always choosing which, which parts you actually want. And I think it's very, very easy. I mean, it's what I call kind of sort of poverty porn or distress porn. Like, you know, you've, there's a really delicate balance between being sensationalist and showing an, a necessary amount of distress and suffering that, that, that you get your message across. And I mean, Louis is really good at that anyway, because tonally with humor, he, he, he does amazing things with humor and, and breaks the ice. And so for me, it's bringing, it's bringing Louis' sensibility and my sensibility and the director's sensibility on that all together. And we, have, we do have a lot of discussions about tone and, oh, is that joke too much? Or, and Louis is 
quite aware of that. So, yeah, it's really great collaborating with him, which is why I've done it a lot. <laughs> I think uh, when I first read Chris's draft of Dunkirk, it was scary and exhilarating because normally he's a heavily dialogue oriented uh, scriptwriter. So you were always pushing the narrative forward through dialogue, whereas uh, Dunkirk was very, very little exposition. And uh, it, it was going to be a very visual film. And, and the visual storytelling, you know, is what was going to make this film worth watching. Uh, and of course, you layer on top of that the intersecting timelines, which Chris loves to play with time. You get this kind of war movie like no other, which is not reliant on, um, you know, carnage and, and blood in the camera and all that kind of thing. It's relying on a, a level of suspense that Chris said earlier that he wanted to maintain. He wanted to run this feeling of your heart beating away right from the first frame of image. You're starting to get tense in that first gunshot boom, you're tense pretty well all the way through the movie. And uh, it was very experimental. When I read the script, I was thinking this could be a $100 million art movie and probably be the end of all of us. But thankfully it wasn't. Baby Driver actually was, was unique, actually. And it was possibly the culmination of the way Edgar and I had started working, potentially a little bit on the reshoots for a film he, uh, Edgar did a few years back called Scott Pilgrim vs. the World where I came on set and did some on-set editing for the additional photography. That developed a little bit more on um, The World's End, where he asked me to be on set for all the action pieces so we can put them together as they were being shot and problem solved. But then with Baby Driver, because there was such an incredible mix of music and live action and drama and dialogue and stunts and everything. Edgar said, you know what, it would probably be really good if you were on set the entire time. And in actual fact, that's actually what happened. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that I had actually worked with Edgar on and off for five years prior to that, helping him prep stuff, even before we kind of shot a frame. I'd had a very long gestation period with him in helping to sort of put sound sequences together and then table reads with sound effects and music and a lot of prep and animatics. I mean, even you know, just before we started shooting Baby Driver, we actually had um, the whole film as an animatic and we could show all the HODs, uh, head of departments in Atlanta, the entire film as basically drawn or storyboarded, which was a fantastic thing to have for reference. If they're shooting two cameras uh, on some of the shows I've done, we've had maybe 80 hours of material. I think three girls might be 40 for one hour. It, it was quite high because Philippa shot it in a really beautiful documentary style where the camera was always moving. We didn't use conventional wide shots and close-ups and reverse shots. So we had more footage, longer takes. In the script, it was beautifully written, first of all, by Nicole Taylor. And she had woven some of the stories together. But because when we were cutting, we discovered some different information, in particularly in episode two, we had to remodel episode two. But we did it together, all of us together. Nicole came to the cutting room and we, we played things out. And there were some scenes that we had to create from material. If we discovered, for example, that Sarah Robotham heard something on the radio and that scene was never shot, I used footage from episode two when she was in the car and wove it together with trees downloaded the original radio interview. So it was, it was actually, finding the structure was very organic and it was very collaborative. All of us were on the same page and we met the real people who were involved and that also kept the onus of responsibility on us to do our best to tell the story in as truthful and as um, considerate a way as possible. Although The Crown is um, considered television for, for Netflix, it's every episode is treated like a feature film. So for me, I have the collaboration with the director, Stephen Daldry, who is amazing. And since he comes from film, he insists on keeping me on to the end of the mix. So as an editor, I'm able to follow the film through to the very end. Well, I edited um, episodes eight and nine. Eight deals with the, uh, with the Kennedys coming to Buckingham Palace. And episode nine is about the Gordonston episode with Prince Philip and the Prince Charles and their experiences there. Now, both episodes 
were completely different in tone. So I had the pleasure of, of editing a comedy and then a very serious, heartbreaking drama. So for me, I had the best of both worlds. In episode nine, although it was brilliantly written, um, I did restructure a lot of it because um, there were times when we cut away from one boy too early and emotionally we wanted to stay with that one boy, whether it was Charles or Philip. Um, I also had to find interesting transitions and um, so visually it was, it was a challenge to, to discover where we should switch over, what shots would complement each other. For example, after Prince Philip bullies the Queen and insists that Charles stay at Gordonston, we added um, one shot of Philip going into the hallway and uh, looking out the window and then there's just a flicker of remorse and he looks down and uh, script-wise, I was meant to cut to young Philip on the obstacle course, but I chose to move up a shot of Charles, young Charles, looking in the trophy cabinet at young Philip. And so this juxtaposition of older Philip cutting to young Charles looking at his father as a young boy in the trophy cabinet with the trophy was uh, emotionally very connecting of all three characters in the show. So I tried to apply that throughout the whole show. There were hours of interviews. Uh, so you had basically the, all the interviews with the main uh, people, all his band members from the New York a day, uh, from his uh, Black Star album and from the album before it. Tony Visconti, of course, the producer. And uh, we had a very, very good archive researcher who found a lot of uh, material for us to use. And of course, they shot on that one they shot uh, all the songs with the bands or key songs with the bands and uh, so it was pretty amazing actually hearing the band that played on the record actually playing the track and then when they gave us David Bowie's clean vocals we were able to sort of construct a version of the track with the band playing live and put his vocals on there which is kind of unique and it was pretty, pretty extraordinary actually pretty extraordinary hearing him sing Lazarus with no music very, very poignant, actually. <laughs> I think the biggest challenge editing this film was just one of keeping it accessible to the audience and keeping the audience with us and not making it so complicated that people just gave up and, and got confused with what they were looking at and just keeping the tension level up and, and keeping the exact point of the emotional release when the little ships showed up with Kenneth Branagh. Uh, that was a really critical moment because if we moved it slightly earlier or later in the timeline, you didn't get the emotional rush that you did when it was in its exact position. And we tested that numerous times because we were trying to pull it forward and trying to push it back and it just found its natural place. That was a big challenge. Um, and I think just you know, keeping true to the reality of the situation and not letting, you know, not letting it be inundated with CG enhancements was the other challenge of, you know, not doing shots with 10,000 little ships coming at you because that's not what happened. <laughs> so, you know, trying to keep it much more real. Uh, and I think the audience know that. I think um, inherently when you watch a film and you see a shot and you just know it's been loaded you kind of well I do anyway I sort of go yeah right um, I think the key skills to be a good editor is to listen be collaborative follow your instincts watch the material see what feels truthful to you and if it feels truthful to you it will feel truthful to the audience you have to be very diplomatic you have to negotiate notes and be an ally for the director, but also not exclude the producers or the exec producers. So sometimes there's a balancing act that we have to do. But in general, all of us, producers, writers, exec producers, all of us, we want the best for the film. So it's actually a very collaborative thing. I think you need a good memory because sometimes when all the notes come in, you might remember something that you'd seen in the material that would actually solve a note that is given in a different way, a different solution maybe to the note given, but most notes that are given, they come from a good place and you have to address whatever that concern is. So I think patience, good memory, diplomatic skills and follow your instinct.
people sort of say when they see stuff that I've done that they, they go, oh, I can see your style. So maybe you do have a style, whether you kind of like it or not. Uh, it's hard to know because it is such an instinctive thing. I guess if you're a musician or an artist or anything more sort of traditionally creative, you'd have a style. And maybe that's better to have that rather than do sort of whatever you're told. So maybe, yeah, I think I probably do have a style. I'm just not sure exactly what it is. But. <laughs>